Today we continue in our year-long series, Hanging On to Love, as we begin a new chapter called Love and Marriage. Join us. Well, good morning, and uh, as we begin our time together today, first of all, welcome. Glad that you've decided to join us here on our stream. It's my prayer that God would bless you and uh, and nurture your spirit today as we share together from God's Word. I want to start today by reading from Psalm 19, something that I was reminded of last week as we concluded our series on habits of love. Let me read from a Psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he is set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy and like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. And we'll just stop it there. Again, we are reminded of the whole earth declaring the beauty of the Lord. And of course, as we read about the commandments and the law of God, the the Torah, we are reminded that the Torah, basically, which we translate law most of the time, really means teaching, uh, that which God instructs us with, uh, the things that God wants us to do. And we know as followers of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Psalms, that that law is ultimately love for God and love for neighbor. And that is exactly what our series is about all year long, is trying to reorient ourselves, to give ourselves a true north in terms of our ethics, in terms of how we are to do things, how we are to think through things. And it is, of course, in light of the love of God and the call of God on our lives to love others as Jesus did and to love God with our whole being. And so as we come into a new chapter today on marriage, uh, this is the North Star kind of uh, chapter. We are talking about how all people who follow Jesus Christ need to aspire to these kinds of relationships. And so as we look at our three chap- our three messages in this chapter called Love and Marriage, I just want to say up front, that I am talking about a North Star idea for Christian people about marriage. And of course, uh, as with everything in life, God reaches out to us in love and in grace. And so we always need to remember that as well. However, let's look at uh, some teaching behind our North Star idea of the vow. But before we do that, let's pray together. Our God, we thank you for your love and for your grace. And Lord, as we deal with this very sensitive topic, a topic where we all struggle in our marriage relationships, uh, Lord, shower us with your grace and your mercy. Help us to understand that that is our primary goal, to love you and each other. And Lord, as we talk about the promise, as we talk about the vow today, I pray that you would help us to understand that we need your grace to even do the most basic things. 
I pray that you would find us truthful. I pray that you would find us faithful. I pray that you would find us willing to aim our sights to the North Star and to work hard to achieve it. But Lord, I also pray that you would give us the grace to understand that we are not condemned because of our inability to do what we want to do. We are saved by your grace and your love and by the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, it is in that spirit that we enter into this time of teaching to understand the value, the significance, and the power of the vow. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So said Jesus in Matthew 22, and yet throughout the span of human history there has been no greater story of brokenness than our utter failure in putting these words of Jesus into action. And so this entire ministry year we've been focusing on Jesus' words in Matthew 22, and we've been asking those questions of how we can align ourselves better with these great commandments upon which all the law and the prophets hang. It's, it's not an easy task to think about, and it's even more difficult to live. Perhaps there's no other area in life where love is tested quite so regularly as in marriage. No other relationship stands so front and center in the Bible as the marriage relationship. And while marriage finds different expressions throughout the world, it is truly a pan-cultural reality. In our Western culture, uh, it's linked to the concept of romantic love. So when people come together in marriage, love is assumed. Yet the centerpiece of Christian marriage is not just the reality of present love, but also the expression of commitment toward one another. It's what we call the vow. And as soon as we hear those words, our minds are moved to the serious side of love. When we think about uh, marriage vows, about promises made at the beginning of a love relationship, they are, in effect, the promise of future love. No wedding would ever happen if the vow were just the promise of present love the love we have right now. I mean, if you don't have present love, you wouldn't be at the altar. Present love is easy, and sometimes when people want to write their own vows, uh, I now, in, in my, as with a bit of maturity and years uh, of experience, tell them to make sure they remember that vows are a promise of future love. It's not just about how you feel right now. It's not just about that romantic, beautiful place you happen to be in in this present moment. It's about allowing your feeling in this moment to create a safe place for love to grow in an unknown future. Making promises of future love can be a daunting task. Committing ourselves to be a specific way in the future where we don't even know what the variables of life will be is a little bit terrifying, and I suppose it should be, because living out the promise of future love is the crucible of commitment. The ultimate test of any promise is the living of life. Words can come pretty easy. Honoring them can sometimes be difficult. Well-known pastor Tim Keller and his wife Kathy in their book on marriage call marriage the most painful the most wonderful. 
These are the two sides of the coin of marriage, if you will. And yet this is the nature of covenantal relationship. A relationship where promises are made about an unknown future. Perhaps this is why God's relationship with Israel and with the church is compared to the marriage relationship. It's in marriage that we come face to face with the stark and often disappointing reality that is oneself. It is in life itself that the heat is turned up on our promises. The vow is a wonderful idea, but it's a costly reality. Or in the words of Robert Service, A promise made is a debt unpaid, and the trail has its own stern code. The Cremation of Sam McGee is an entertaining poem about keeping one's promises and struggles and regret that are an inevitable part of that journey. In the Genesis passage, it says that a man is joined to his wife, and the word that's used there in the Hebrew text speaks about a gluing together. It's also used in the Bible to refer to metalwork of the soldering of metal joints together. But we can see in 1 Kings 22:34 that it's those places in an armor, in the body armor, that are soldered together that are in fact the most vulnerable parts of the armor. It's a good word to describe the marriage relationship. The vows we make are the vulnerable piece that connects us together in what the Kellers call the most painful, the most wonderful. And it's always both. It's not just one or the other, but yet sometimes one seems louder than the other. Sometimes the painful is like that toddler throwing a temper tantrum, and the wonderful is like the whispering sound of a breeze blowing through the summer leaves. In other words, the painful moments seem to hold our attention, get our attention, and remind ourselves of the reality that comes with it. But more than that, it's not just a cost-benefit relationship. The vow also reminds us of the sacred side of love. We're reminded of Paul's words after quoting the Genesis passage. He says, the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. We find that in Ephesians 5, 31, 32. When Paul wrote that uh, marriage is a great mystery and then connects that to our understanding of Christ being one with the church, he elevates marriage, the marriage connection and rightly says that it's a mystery. Marriage mirrors the mystery between Christ and the church. And yet, while marriage is a mystery, it is both physical and spiritual. It mirrors for Paul the relationship Christ has with his church. He's fully committed to her, to you and to me. Jesus has spoken his vow to his bride, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we take comfort and find confidence in these words. It's this confidence that we have in that Jesus creates for us where we see the security of love. Listen to God speak uh, of his relationship to Israel. He says he is the husband to Israel, though she is unfaithful. He makes this promise. I will make you my wife forever showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. No matter what happened in the life of Israel, the people could come back to these words spoken by God himself, and they could know the grace and mercy that existed within that relationship because of this promise, because of this security. You see, the vow creates a safe space to have strength and courage and grace to face our brokenness. You see, make no mistake, as as much as Israel was broken, God is faithful. 
There's a security that comes with that that eases our anxiety and helps us give of ourselves. The purpose of the vow is to create a safe place for us to grow, for us to recognize the ugliness of our own sin and yet know we are still loved. Of course, there's dangers in any analogy in the Bible between God and and human. Human relationships can never be exactly the same as God's relationship to us. Hence, there are analogies, not actual things. And yet, this remains our aspiration. It is our North Star that guides us. But more than this, it's also a reminder that even when our promises fail and when we are in need of grace, God is there for us. God is not broken, and He is infinitely stronger and more merciful than us. Make no mistake, we are all in need of God's mercy. We have all felt at various times, like that poem by Robert Service, like we are carrying a frozen corpse across the frozen tundra. And at other times, it was our spouse doing the carrying. We all need mercy. We all need grace. And yet, we carry on. In the words of my five-year-old son regarding marriage, a promise is a promise. Right, Daddy? And so it is. Ultimately, a promise is at the very heart of a covenant relationship. And yet Keller writes in his book on marriage, in any relationship there will be frightening spells in which your feelings of love seem to dry up. And when that happens, you must remember that the essence of a marriage is that it is a covenant, a commitment, a promise of future love. Now, are there guarantees for success? No. Is this always the outcome up and to the right? No. The promise of future love is what God offers to us. The promise of future love is the security that we long for. And so, the promise of future love remains our North Star that, with God's help, will continue to guide us in both the calm and the storms of marriage and life. Welcome back to The Point After. Uh, Brent, here we are. Um, At least now now that we're back in the orange status, we get to at least talk to each other a little more face-to-face, which is enjoyable. So let's... um, just take a moment as we think about this chapter four, love and marriage that we're doing. Uh, we obviously are going to be trying to sort of look at what we think is a biblical Christian worldview to, to marriage. Um, and, he, and yet I got to admit, the first angst I feel about teaching on this series is knowing that there's people in our community, uh, people who are joining us now online in both of our, our services and we know that there's brokenness. We know that yes. the vows that we talk about today that were so important, they have been broken. And what do we say to people like that? I'm going to put you on the hot spot first here and let you, let you sure. take a run at sure. it. Well, I think part of the problem, at least for me in this, is that there is a, a level of separation at this point between us and our people. Normally, we're right there. People can see us. We can, we can show compassion in, in person. Yes. Whereas uh, in these moments, uh, it, it's a little more difficult to do that. But of course, always we want to convey grace. Uh, the gospel has to be at the very heart of our lives, including our marriages. And that can give us strength to succeed in keeping those vows. But when those vows aren't going to be happening, when they're broken, uh, and even times where they're broken in such a way that it's hard to put the finger on where it went wrong, yes. there needs to be gospel in that. Uh, you know, we need to see people. Uh, well, you were mentioning a little earlier about the woman at the well in John mm. chapter 4 and how Jesus kept his north star moral compass you know he says salvations of the jews he says Mm -hmm. he tells her that he knows all about her marriage uh history um and yet he still continues the conversation he's gracious you can see his love for her and when she invites him back to the village to tell about this good news 
he goes. Mm. And so there is this compassion and grace that just overflows in Jesus' life that we need to grab hold of at the same time as we hold on to the North Star guiding principles that the Bible gives us about marriage. And I think that that imagery of the North Star, but recognizing to keep the you know, imagery going, that we all have these little boats out on the sea of life that have all these storms, and sometimes we don't navigate well. It doesn't change the reality of the North Stars. It's still there. But, but how we navigate and how we move forward, um, tremendous amount of grace. Yes. Um, yeah, and so again, we just hoped, I guess one thing I would want to say to everyone who's watching this, just to remind people that um, we just hope people can live in that tension of, of recognizing we want compassion, and yet we don't want to let go of what we think is, is God's desire for all of us That's right. uh, within the marriage. And, yeah. and that ties back to this baseline of saying um, it's important that we don't have a consumeristic view to marriage. We have a, a, a covenantal view. That's right. I think the pastoral concerns are always one of aspiration of where we want to go, yes. but also compassion. Yes. Because we don't want to leave people behind, and yet sometimes some people are finding it a struggle to keep up. And so it's always that tension between wanting to make a clear North Star statement, yes. but yet not wanting to hurt or further hurt uh, people who are already struggling um, with uh, broken relationships. And so right. s somehow to have the compassion of Christ in the midst of a clear moral compass and North Star guiding statement about marriage. Yes, yeah. Well, we don't have a lot of time left uh, for our, 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 our time today, Brent, but one of the things that I know I didn't bring up my message that I wanted to uh, highlight a just a little more specifically was, um, you know, we often talk about... Um, the importance of keeping a promise. And one element is that keeping a promise helps really define who we are. Yes. Um, if, if you are a, you know, a person who keeps a promise, that actually helps shape um, who you're becoming. Right. Right? Um, and, and I think sometimes we forget about that because we think we let so many other things define who we are. But in this case, actually, keeping a promise changes us. Right. Um, and, and, and I just think that that's important when we think about the power of keeping the promise in the marriage, about how is that going to change me yes. in the days to come, right? Oh, exactly, exactly. It speaks to, uh, at the heart of every relationship, we have our character. <laughs> and, uh, and so that, that needs to be revealed. And, um, and, and one way of revealing that, our, the steadfastness and the, the honor part, I guess, is, is that keeping of a promise. A promise made. And the thing about a marriage promise is that you're promising something that you really have no clue. You know, it's that all that you're going future to, love. It's right? that future love. And and again, it's a and a future by definition is uncertain. Yes. We simply don't know. That's right. But the only thing we can take into that unknown future is this promise. That's right. And that shows you just how powerful it is. I've often heard people talk about how, well, I got married when I was in my 20s, and I'm a completely different person now, and they're a completely different person, and so it's just not going to work. And the thing about the promise for the future is, is that that speaks into that, yes. right? We do need to, ch we do change. Yes, we do. I'm not the same person I was that I was when I was 20, thank, thankfully. Right? Yes. Um, but yet, and my wife, not the same. She was 20 as well. Uh, but you learn to grow into each other uh, together over time, keeping those pro that promise. And uh, yeah, at some point, you just you have to you have to choose to change in the same direction as the other person, as opposed to being autonomous and just wanting to be free of everything. So it, it, it's interesting when you think about the power of the promise too that we're talking today. Um, one study I read uh, while we were preparing for this, it says that. Um, Two-thirds of marriages can recover from a bad time within five years of the crisis they feel they're in. That's right. So, so when someone says, I just can't make it any further in this marriage, um, studies show that if they hang in, in their, they talk to them five years later, they're like saying, no, we're, we're in a good place again. But what anchors us during that hard time? Right. It's, it's the promise. It's the vow. Yeah. So, um, well, look, we um, are just wrapping up. We just, again, want to thank you for joining us in The Point After. Um, 
And again, we're hoping that, again, you'll just uh, stay with us. You'll invite others to um, look at this. And I, again, I, I just always want to say this sometimes, and I never say it enough, I think, to our congregations, Brent, but we try to remind people to say, you know, hopefully some of the, some of the preaching that we're doing or teaching we're doing is good for grandparents who are talking to their grandchildren who are right. thinking about getting married. Uh, this is great for couples who are maybe just on the verge of deciding going down that marriage yes, path. That's right. And hopefully for a lot of people who are in their marriages, no matter what season they're in, this becomes a great encouragement and inspiration as we talk about the aspiration and still show compassion there you go. in this preaching. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, see you later next week. Take care. Let's pray. God, we thank you for bringing us here today for revealing to us the importance of commitment to you, uh, to your ways and also to one another. And Lord, we know that the marriage relationship really is that, uh, that relationship where love comes full bloom in every way. And we pray, God, that in it, we would glorify you. Uh, Lord, we often look to ourselves and our needs. We often look to uh, how we can get what we want out of life. But we pray, God, that we would never overstep and that we would look to you first and foremost in our lives as to how we can give ourselves to you and then give ourselves over to the one to whom we have pledged ourselves. And so God, help us in this way and teach us what it means uh, to fulfill those promises uh, that we made, some of us very long time ago. Help us to renew those day by day. And Lord, for those who are in situations of brokenness, I pray for your healing and help and that, Lord, you would plot the path forward for them. For, Lord, we know that you never abandon us or leave us. Even when our situa situations are desperate, you are always there helping us and leading us along the way. And so, Lord, help us as people as we follow the, the, the North Star in our lives, that you would help us as well to remember grace and loving kindness. For this is how you have treated us. You have treated us this way in every aspect of life. And so, God, for this we are thankful, for your grace, for your mercy, for the forgiveness of our sins. We give you thanks. And we pray, God, as we go forward, you would give us strength to obey, that you would give us strength to follow, that you would give us strength to overcome the obstacles that are in front of us, and that, Lord, you would heal us. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Amen. All right. We'll be back here again in seven days. I hope to see you then. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his countenance shine upon you. May his face be toward you and grant you his peace. Amen. Relevant, practical, authentic. River of Life.